which brings us to the final stage, that of visualization, which is a very confusing um, place to be currently in Python because there are many ways you can go about the same thing. What we will talk about today is mainly matplotlib and things that are built on top of it, namely the native pandas API that calls matplotlib. Talk a bit about Seaborn, but there are many things that are that build their visualizing capabilities on top of matplotlib. Things like network X for data, um, for network data, things things like uh, the plotting API of Scikit-Learn, and other things you might be familiar with. ggplot. I think this is what Michael referred to earlier as a port of ggplot two for um, Python. I tend to like to uh, exist here in this part between Bokeh Data Shader Hall of Views, which is a project called the Hall of Us project that has tools that we won't talk about today, but I that I very much like to introduce at some point if I get the chance. These are things that both run in a Jupyter Notebook and in a Bokeh server without a Jupyter Notebook. So things that you can, that, that have a lot of JavaScript niceness, if I can put it that way, but with a, with a running Python server that can provide interactiveness. And since Bokeh is a basically a plotting server that uses the same, um, server technology that a Jupyter Notebook uses, a Tornado server, if you're interested, then you can develop your, well, visualizations or web apps in a Jupyter Notebook, have them run using this to the shared uh, server, and you can just serve them on their own in their own web page. Uh, Yannick mentioned Plotly, which lives here. Also something that can be integrated in the Jupyter Notebook, also a very intuitive API. And also something that can be, that can quote, talk to the PyVis um, part. D3JS, actually let's, let's go to the source of this. And if you go to the source, you can actually click on these and you can go to the respective projects. So. There's D3JS, there's a huge deluge of things that we won't introduce today. So today we'll just talk about Matplotlib. And honestly, Matplotlib was the most difficult part of the tutorial to prepare because it would need a session on its own of a couple of hours because it's powerful as it is. It has a very steep learning curve if you want to do things from scratch or if you want to understand the, the, the nitty gritty, like uh, on behind the curtains thing. And that doesn't make, it doesn't make it easier that when you look things up, te people tend to be sometimes confused about how to do things because there are two ways you can use Matplotlib. And these are pointers that that are based on like personal experience that that aren't necessarily the right thing to 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 to, to keep in mind, but it's things that are useful to me. Is that there are two ways to interact with Matplotlib? There is the uh, well, PyPlot that we will use that you will mostly use, which is like a state state based like uh, line by line painting almost sort of procedural style. And there's an object oriented style, which is a low level API that gives you access to the, to, to, to the lower level APIs that are available in Matplotlib. So when you look up things online, try to keep, try to be mindful of how these tutorials or stack overflow questions are handling things. Um, naming conventions, sometimes they're weird, counterintuitive, because, well, um, 
even though the project has matured now, it started as a bunch of engineers who were, who were used to coding in MATLAB code up something that could be used in Python when open source started to become a thing in the sciences. And you'll see a lot of um, remnants of that. You'll see weird things like getters and setters, which aren't usually used um, in Python. So you'll see something like get figure, get access. And speaking of access, there are two things, two different kinds, oh Jesus, two different kinds of objects that you will see used. There's the axes, plural, and there's axis. Both are objects and both, both are different things. And that's also something to be mindful of when, when you're coding in Matplotlib, when you're listening to tutorials, try to pick up the subtlety of someone saying axes versus axis. Now the axes object, the plural has multiple axis objects, usually X and Y, more if you're doing 3D things, but don't because that's not usually nice to look at. Um, there are different backends because at the end of the day, you're providing code that has to draw something at, and some part of the OS will have to actually draw it. And there are different backends, different things on your computer that know how to draw something. There is, there are interactive backends, which we will use today. So some part of this workflow that we're, that we're looking at, will have to know how to draw something inside a browser, but not only inside a browser, inside a Jupyter cell. Um, but other things like hard copy backends will know how to print a PDF. will know how to, uh, <clears throat> use other APIs, other lower level constructs of the OS. If you're using um, Python in the, uh, on the command line, like in the interpreter, if you're on Linux, you'll have one backend. If you're on Windows, you have another. If you're on Mac, you have another. So this is just something to, to keep in mind that the backend is the lower level, very low level thing that handles all the heavy lifting on, in terms of drawing. Um, and in terms of layer, there's a somewhat more middleware there i'd call it maybe there's the artist layer that takes what you describe and just creates things that can be drawn like patches and squares and things and gives it to the back end and these are different layers that some tutorials might refer to and the official faq is as always <clears throat> the best way to get information about all the general concepts. It's usually very important, not just to just jump in and start plotting things, but first understand what's going on. What's a figure, what are axes, what's an axis, backends, coding styles, probably talks about this, yeah, the MATLAB style, that sort of thing. Um, again, the PyPlot scripting API is what we'll use what you will use most of the time if you end up using matplotlib and if you open the do documentation that we link to you can see all the functions everything that the pyplot api is able to do you can plot polar coordinates set the color map to pink there's a function for that apparently pie chart never ever use a pie chart um yeah, leave it to you. It's an exercise to the reader to go through that. Um, very few words about what a figure is in matplotlib. Usually a figure is the highest level thing you'll deal with. It's the container for everything that's being drawn. So a figure is what contains um, the axes object here. The axes object is one axis, X axis, Y axis. These are line objects that define this. Markers for the points, the spines of the plot are these lines, including the ticks that are encompassing the figure. You have the grid and all these are objects that you can both access in an object oriented way or that the PyPlot API can do for you by calling the appropriate function. 
Now, there's one last thing we have to do before we start using matplotlib. And if you remember magics, these small functions that change the behavior of Jupyter Notebook, you'll remember that you can call the interrogation mark on them. And you will see that you have to make a decision as to what backend you use. There's some tutorials you'll encounter use this backend, the inline backend, which is the default for Jupyter Notebooks. A newer one is the one that we will use, which is the notebook backend, namely this one here, which will provide interactivity. And in order for us to figure out what backend is being used, remember that we imported the entire the entire package, which isn't something that you usually do, except if you want to access low level things. If we call it get backend, we will see that the current backend is the inline backend. But we want the notebook backend because we want our plots to be interactive, not just pictures printed in the output of cells. And if I call get backend again, I copy that. Now I have a notebook backend. You can style your plots using the plt.style attribute. We can call available on that to see what styles are available. 538 might be a data science blog that you're uh, familiar with that uses that theme. If you like ggplot, the R plotting library, you can get a style that looks like that. You can get a Tableau, which is another um, charting library. And I have to say, it just something came to my mind. What we're going through here is only how to build visualizations. It doesn't, we're not gonna address what makes a good visualization. That, that's something that you have to look up on your own because it's important that not only you know how to convey information, but what information to convey in what way. And we would recommend something like, more design oriented visualization books like the works of Edward Tufte or just blog posts. I will use the use function. I will call that on the style attribute and I will use seaborn dash pastel for no good reason, just because. If we introspect the plt.plot function, which we will use to plot our data, we see we can call it with uh, an X and a Y. It's obviously much more information here that you can go through. And if I call it with plt.plot46, we see that we don't see anything. And that's because I have to provide a marker for it. I'll provide an X marker, which basically tells it how to draw the point. Oh dear, can you see that? Yes, it's a bit faint, but yeah. Yeah, let me try. Yeah, I'll draw a point on top of it. You'll see that as I run these commands procedurally, like this uh, scripting API is just changing things and the open figure that I have. Again, the figure, this thing, is the axes object, which is comprised of the actual place where it plots and the axis, x-axis and y-axis. And uh, I can add a point, add another place in the plot. And since this is printing on the current available axis, I can actually call the plt.gca get current axis to see which active axis is being axes object is, see, I even make the mistake. It's an axes object. I can get the current one, put that in AX and then call the axis function to basically change the X limits from zero to five and the Y limits from two to 10. And that changes that. Um, now an axes object has children that we can call 
get children on and get these children and you see the different parts that make up this um the the plot that we see we see the four spines that encompass the the plot so this line this line and with the text and the other two the axis each of the axis objects and then the four things that we the four batches that we put patches that we plotted now this isn't a level of um of of uh, this isn't something you'd interact with when using maple lib this is more of showing you the lower level parts of it in case you need to uh, interact at this level there's also get current figure so get me the current active figure function and that also has children an axes object and the rectangle patch around it um now this is particularly useful but it's interesting to show you the difference between um the succinctness of doing something like this and what actually goes on behind the scenes when you call plt.plot because when you call plt.plot is just it just does all the heavy lifting for you using the object oriented api and it just hides away all the details that aren't useful to you when you're a machine learning researcher just wanting to plot something very quickly but you could do the same thing we did you'd have to import a new backend import the figure object define one and pi plot when you call plt.plot does this automatically by well first seeing if there is currently an active figure by calling the get current figure and if there is none it creates one and since we were calling plt.plot and was adding to the current figure we saw that it only created a figure once and the same figure was implicitly used um, later on um, we instantiate a figure we use that figure can i please re-explain the children part uh, it's just a way of seeing what constitutes an object so the axes object is the high level container and it contains many parts inside it so axes is the entire thing but what is it composed of well an axes object is the x-axis the y-axis, the actual points that are plotted, the spines of the plot, meaning this square thing that encompasses it, the ticks, the numbers that, that, that are associated with the ticks. And when you call get children on an axis object, it gives you all, this, all the parts that constitute it. In the same way, a figure is also composed of an axis object and other objects. So children is basically a way of saying a relationship where something creates what's under it. Sure thing. So now that we have a figure object, we can call this function on it. We add a subplot, which we'll see later is a way of dividing a figure into many smaller plots many axes in one figure you'll see this here that it was explicitly decided to be created now it's only one row and one column meaning it's only actually one axis object but it's still a subplot and this one tells us that after you create the subplot at position one and row one column one give it back to me Give me the first um, subplot, which in this case is only one. And you'll notice something that's, um, that's not very Pythonic here, not very programming language here, is that this is one indexed, not zero indexed. There are a lot of places where things are one indexed. So keep that in mind if you're iterating over things. And we will add these two points. Now this backend that we're using doesn't know how to uh, 
how to print to the output of a Jupyter notebook. So I will just have the backend save that into a PNG file and we can, if we remember the Jupyter lecture tutorial, we can turn this into Markdown and just basically link to the image um, object plot from the current hard drive. Yeah. And we can see that for that much work, we only get this, which was basically two calls to plt.plot. Okay, let's go back to pyplot. I'll actually do something here. I will explicitly call plot.figure just in case, because sometimes I find that if I run things, things might be uh, displayed in a different plot if it's still being detected as active. So this thing explicitly creates a new figure under the current cell and plots everything in it which would have been the default behavior if you were using the other backend, the magic notebook inline, because then every time you call a cell, that's a different figure. There is no interactivity. You can't add to it. Again, remember this function in NumPy that creates a sort of a range between zero and two with 100 points equal at equal intervals. So what you'd expect, 100 points between zero and two. Let's plot X, its square, and its cube. See the labels that we provide are included in the legend. Now the legend is provided because we called the plt.legend function. We can add a title to a plot. And since this is an active figure, we can actually just call this again from a different cell and uh, x4, what we call this, um, call this Michael. <laughs> Can't think of what <laughs> this might be called. We can see the new line plotted. Now we'd have to call plot.legend again to see the Michael curve be included. What, what is it called? Uh, does it have a name? Uh, I can't think of it either. Huh. It's called Michael. Um, Fine. Yeah, we, we can also define styles on a, in a contextual basis. So this thing I took from the uh, matplotlib documentation and it's a way to plot things in a style that is reminiscent of the, a -A -X -C, the a -X XKCD comics that you're probably Oh, um, it's called Quartic by the way. Of course it is. <laughs> Let's leave it at Michael <laughs> Quartic. That's... And I found this by just going into the matplotlib gallery, which is what your workflow is going to be usually in all things. Visualization is to go to the gallery, see something that is similar enough to your use case and just iterate on that. Now let's talk about subplots. Um, the following examples I took from, again, the documentation was Let's first create our data, which again is a 
bunch of points on the x-axis and the function that we want to plot is these points, their values squared and the sign of that. And to create subplots, we call the plt.subplots object, which we've, we're doing implicitly when we were plotting, it was calling um, the subplots function and just creating something with one plot. And you'll see that this function, we can unpack its return tuple and get the figure and the axes object, that's plural axes. Um, if we create two subplots, one row, two columns, we can call the share Y to say that we would like these two subplots to share, to share the same Y axis. We get the axes objects, axes one and axes two, and we, call, we can call plot on each of them. And we can, if we call the plot function, that we'll get the same thing here. And if we call the scatter function on the second axes, we'll get a scatter plot of the same data. If we call subplots with more than one row, then it will create what you'd expect of it. In this case, two rows, two columns, and we've provide further keyword arguments to be passed down to the appropriate um, function, specifying that we want polar coordinates in this case. And this axes list, it's, it's actually a list of axes if we look at it. It's many axes objects. And we can index those the way we're used to. So first row, first column, second row, second column. And we can plot in this subplot and scatter in this one. And the other ones are not touched. We can actually do the same thing if we call this again and zero one and add something here. and plot in one zero. We saw the share Y attribute. We can share the same column. Uh, we can share the same uh, X axis for a column. We can share the Y axis between rows and we can share everything among, among X and Y. Let's go through a final example that shows you how you can unpack these into axes object as opposed to just uh, using a list and just this, uh, using indexing to access these objects, you can let's start a new figure first to, ah, uh, sorry, I, this is a different example. This is plotting a, uh, a multi-line basically out of this X and Y choosing the line width parameter to be five. So the lines are thicker that we're used to zero specified points, uh, oh, specifies points. I'm not sure, uh, and B specifies the color blue, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And you'll, I, I haven't mentioned the interactivity of this backend, but you can see the X, Y coordinate changing as I move the mouse, you can resize this. And it's 
moderately uh, responsive. You can download the plot as a PNG. You can pan, you can zoom. But again, introspect this using the interrogation mark to see, or just use the API documentation to see what exactly you can do, what sort of styling that is. We're not going to go into that too much here. Um, let us call the plt.subplots function with two rows and two columns. And since it returns all these axes objects, we can unpack them the way they are returned. The first row and the second row all enclosed in a parenthesis that says they're stacked on top of each other in a column-wise column fashion. And it also returns the figure like we saw earlier. So if I call that, it creates four empty subplots with ax axes one, plural, axes two, and bottom row axes three and axes four. And I can just plot my functions by calling these axes objects and the relevant function that I'm interested in. So normal plot, scatter plot, bar plot, and finally a histogram. But what you'll usually find yourself doing is not interfacing the Maplelib library directly, but since you probably already have a data frame, which we already do, you can use the df.plot API. On every function, on every data frame, you can call the plot function, and that plot function knows how to use Matplotlib. And recently also it knows how to use other libraries, including some which are showcased in the image we saw earlier. So you can change not only the back end, as it were, but you can change the entire visualization library if you have um, a preference for one. I think Plotly should have a read it and plot API for pandas. We're not going to go into that right now, but just so you know, it doesn't have to be. Um, Matplotlib, but if I call df.plot, we'll see that this doesn't really make sense because it just represented everything as a, as a polyline, which makes sense for um, time series data, but this isn't time series data. This is just quote high dimensional uh, features. We can call df.plot and tell it that we want a scatter plot with sepal length and sepal width. We can call, directly call, instead of specifying kind equals scatter, we could have said df.plot.scatter or directly df.scatter. And we can call the hist function. And that does all the heavy lifting of uh, creating the subplots, of, of creating the names, which it takes from the column names. We can do a box plot, a histogram, plot.hist, specifying the number of bins you'd like to use, a kernel density estimate, which is basically a smooth functional version of these histograms. And again, recommend you just check out either the documentation or the actual introspection to see the kind of things you can access since this is accessing matplotlib you can well for one if you have an active figure that you'd like to plot to you can give it as a parameter the mat the the axes again plural object and it will do its drawing in, in, in the axes object that you want. So in this example where we had the axes one, two, three, four, we could have passed in axes two to df.plot and it would, it would have drawn it there. Now there's a second plotting API that you call from the package itself, which is the plotting API. And that 
gives you the functionality of being able to create a scatter matrix, which is a pairwise scatter plot with the histogram on the diagonal for each of the rows and columns in your data set. So on the diagonal, where sepal length meets sepal length, so it's the same feature, it gives you a distribution of the feature so you can observe the profile of that. And when a row meets a different column, you get a scatter plot of the features for that. A, another thing you can access from this pandas.plotting um, sub package is the parallel coordinates um, plot. And I had to explicitly add plot.figure here because for some reason this function was not creating a new figure as one would expect, but it was using the last active axes object, which happened to be the last one in the previous figure, which was currently active, and it was drawing my, my plot here. So it goes to show that sometimes things are a bit messy when you're using the um, the notebook backend instead of the inline backend. And what we see here is a parallel coordinates plot, which is something that is used when you want to visualize high dimensional data. Now, in our case, it's not very high dimensional, it's just four dimensions. But since we saw that the time series representation doesn't work for data in which order doesn't make any sense, this is one way of representing our data where every feature is a line that's parallel to all the others, and every data point is a polyline that intersects these parallel lines at the appropriate point. And this is something that is used, for example, in when, when you're when you're um, when you're tuning your hyperparameters, and that's usually extremely high dimensional. There are many hyperparameters to tune, and you would you would visualize performance using a polyline there and see, try to be able to compare. Now, what, what this can tell us is that, well, this is messy. All the lines are just going through each other, but. It seems to be that both pedal length and pedal width are good features to discriminate among the three classes because we see a good, a nice uh, bundle here that's that we are able to discriminate from the others. And these two, although are being mixed into each other, they're probably being mixed into each other in a way that's different from this mixing here. So there might be enough information both here and here to be able to discriminate between the two. So this might be a useful plot to just get a overview, like a high level view of what your data actually looks like. One last thing that I want to show you is the Seaborn API that, that that is a very nice, very useful, very pretty wrapper around matplotlib that does a lot of the heavy lifting again for you. I would recommend that you actually go to the uh, documentation again to see, well, for one, let me just bring that up. Seaborn. For one, for you to see the gallery, to see what is available and the actual API to see the different kinds of plots. But what this does actually is just a, a wrap it around, around matplotlib that does things in its own way and its own style. So even if you import Seaborn and just use matplotlib, it will change the style for matplotlib as well. It just changes the entire thing for you. I'll import Seaborn. And as I said, people are picky about the names they import packages with, and Seaborn is usually imported as SNS. So we can call the pair plot function on the data frame and tell it to color things by target. That just broke my browser window. That's too big. I, why is it? Why is it zooming in? 
Mm -hmm. Or it doesn't do it for me. Okay. Um, let me see if I can access. Is maybe your browser window zoomed in general? Because there's also this symbol mm -hmm. in the URL bar that might indicate this. Yeah, it is zoomed. Um, let me reset the original view. If you would be so kind. Anyway, you get the gist with just one small function call. We get this very informative, very elaborate, and might I add, quite pretty looking, much prettier than the default matplotlib style. The same sort of plot as the scatter matrix that we could get using the pd.plotting API, but just a different way of doing it, which is always a nice thing to, to have in your tool belt. Um, I'll explicitly call plot.figure to create a new figure. I'll plot the correlation matrix. Let's first look at what it looks like. It's just basically the correlation of every feature with every other feature, including one when it's with itself. Uh, since we're using the interactive backend, these are all still active and my, my notebook is complaining that there are too many of them active. So I can just stop the interactive aspect and basically turn it into an image. And if I click open image, a new tab, I just get the plot that you can save. Um, I'll just close a few of them before my computer explodes. Yeah, that should be enough. And we'll go back to Seaborn. Get a heat map of the correlation matrix. Um, we can probably choose a, a nicer color map, but I'm not going to be bothered by that this moment you can just look up um, the SNS so heat map function and you can see that you can give it a color map Let's see if we have uh, examples of color maps that we can just try I'm assuming this is one. This is usually one. Hideous. Inferno. You could just. Another thing that we can do is what they call a pair grid. Uh huh. Interesting. Why is it that big? Anyway. So this pair grid function creates also subplots for you, but when you pass it a data frame, it already does a lot of um, housekeeping for you. So it, it, it's ready with, with um, the two axes, pedal width and sepal length, the sepal length, for example. And using this G object that the pair grid function returned, you know, if you look at type of G, it's a pair grid object. We can map things using mapper functions that we pass to certain plots to. So if I um, 
is that if I pass scatter plot on the upper diagonal, uh, kernel density estimate on the lower diagonal, and another kernel density estimator plot on the diagonal itself, this will actually plot those. One final thing that we could do is a joint plot. If you remember the parallel coordinates that we saw, we saw that pedal length and pedal width might be two good features to be able to tell these classes apart. And if we choose exactly these two features in our joint plot, we can see that the classes do indeed discriminate rather easily. Um, that's all I had planned. Thank you for listening. And do you have any questions or remarks? Thank you very much. I have learned something today. I've only ever used this uh, standard inline backend before, but this interactive one is quite nice. It's, it's definitely useful when you're iterating and trying things out because it's it's quite a headache to code with matplotlib. Yeah. And it's easier if you just can see how, th or th how things are actually changing live. Okay, so it doesn't look like there are any questions. Unless someone is furiously typing out a very long question right now. You're welcome, Lucas. Okay, then I think we are done for today. Thank you very much, Chris, for this very nice and informative tutorial. My and pleasure.